All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So the Omicron continues to help. It is a good thing. Let's look at some of the data that is coming out of South Africa. This is a report on 8th December. So one more week after. So we can kind of assume that we are in the third week. And the reports now are going to become more and more reliable. This report is uh, in a news article by a re- and the reporting doctor is Dr. Richard Friedland. He is the CEO of NetCare Hospitals in South Africa. I think, so I'm putting my opinion out and you can just dismiss it right in the beginning if you want. I think that we are uh, getting near to a pandemic that is going to be wound up by Omicron, thanks to Omicron. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Let's quickly look at the references. So this is drbean.com. Imagine that these talks and a similarly high quality talks, talks, talks are on Dr. Bean as well. So if you would like to have access to more content, you can go and buy that. This is the South Africa's uh, situation. I'm going to go over that in a second. So look at this. A very speedy and high, a very steep exponential kind of a increase in cases. This is the report I'm talking about. Netcare says so far it has been, it has seen far less severe COVID-19 symptoms for Omicron variant. What I've done is I've gone over this and created a summary for us where there is the questions that were in my mind is, who are the folks who are still at risk of Omicron? And how is Omicron behaving with the rest of the population? So these are the two important questions that I've answered. This is the Hotang's data. And if you see, do you see that the cases are actually now reducing? This has gone up to 16,000 at the, some point or 12, 13,000, and it is going down again. So that is an interesting trend as well. So let me just look at trends first. So here is the number of cases. If I go further down here, look at this. This was the trend of how fast the growth in number of cases was. And at some point, for example, here, on December 7th, the growth was 1,649%, seven-day uh, rolling average. Then 1,673%, 16, 17 times increase in cases. And look at this, December 9, 1,477, and December 10th, 1,282. Now, does it have something to do with the weekend that is coming in as well? Maybe, I don't think so. But even the cases that rose are now on the downward trend too. And here is the most important thing that you would see in the discussion. This is the most important thing for me. There is a decoupling of the deaths from the cases. If that happens, imagine this, if it is zero deaths from the cases, then we're good. Omicron could do whatever it wants. It would actually help immune us. It would give us immunity. However, there still is death. So please keep an eye on the discussion today to see who are still at risk. But if you see here, the number of deaths are actually continuing to go down. Not only they're decoupled, they are going down. So with this background, with this context, let's start our discussion. So this is Dr. Richard Friedland. He is the CEO of NetCare Hospitals. And I have the link to these uh, articles in the description. So this we just saw, cases are increasing rapidly. And he made a comment. He said, it is possible that the cases are increasing rapidly. And maybe because of that, hospitalizations are yet less because all of a sudden there's a pile of cases. But at the same time, you would have seen in our previous discussions that the patient symptom set does not live on for a longer period of time. They become okay within one to two days. So that means that it is possible to rely on this data to say, yes, cases are increasing and yes, deaths are not associated with them or very few deaths are occurring. So back here, this is the deaths. And as I just showed you as well, The number of deaths over here have gone down to 19. They were 22, 23. Before that, if I go back here to this one, see this 19, 23, 21, 24, 30. 
31. Then they were down to 12. It is something like that. And then they were higher. So South Africa came from a higher number of deaths down. Then they had a slight upturn, which once again has continuously going downwards. Even the rate is dropping now. So the rate which I just showed you, that it had gone to 16, 17 times increase, and even that has now dropped to 12 times increase. So here is an important thing from the, from the report by Dr. Finland. Blocked or runny nose, headache, and scratchy or sore throat. This is a similar set of symptoms that uh, Dr. Kutzia had reported as well. So the symptoms are not further changing. This is it. And he says early trends of this fourth wave since 15, 15 November 2021, when admission began to rise, indicate a far less severe form of COVID-19 and a probable decoupling of the rate of community transmission and the rate of hospital transmission, said Dr. Friedland. And I'll show you the data. It's, it's such a marvelous data. Most in hospital COVID positive do not need oxygen. That is amazing. And we would see that, that uh, in the data, he says almost 100% of the patients used to need oxygen. And now 90% do not need oxygen. In the hospital, admitted, do not need oxygen. Most of the cases in hospital that are COVID-19 positive do not require any form of oxygen therapy and are considered incidental findings. In a primary care setting, the same mild or moderate clinical picture is being experienced. It is our considered view at this early stage that should this trend continue, COVID-19 may be effectively managed at a primary care level with the exception of certain cases requiring admission to tertiary facilities. And can I actually add something to this? In the US, at least for the US, when somebody has COVID, until they become blue in their face and they need oxygen, we don't ask them to do anything. If you take this statement and then apply it to the US, do you know what Omicron would mean for US? People would stay at home and become okay and move on. The long COVID is still a question mark. Then this is the data. So I went over the news article and I pulled the, some data together to kind of see it in a summary. So status on Dr. Richard Friedland. Last three waves and this wave. Let's see the comparison. Symptoms. So some of this is subjective and some of this is data and I'll show you the data as well. Ne next slide has data. Symptoms. Severe symptoms in the first three waves to a point that people were dying as well at a much higher rate. Omicron wave, far mild symptoms. Once again, sore throat, scratchy throat, headache, uh, congested nose. Oxygen requirement. Previously, almost if they were admitted to hospital in one way or the other, almost 100% needed oxygen. Here, 90% do not need oxygen. Could be treated as outpatient? Yes. Hospital admission, community spread and rate of admission are also decoupled. They were tied together in the past waves. That means in the past wave, if the wave would increase the number of cases, then number of hospitalizations would increase as well. He used the word inundated. He said, we were inundated with the cases in the past when the wave would occur. And here we have a wave and there is no patient or very few patients. Age of admitted patients. So this is an important one. So when you're discussing this with your friends, with your family, keep this in mind. Previous waves, age, 40% were lesser than 50 years of age, 40%, only 40%. And the average age of hospital admissions were 54 years of age. This wave, Omicron, 71% are lesser than 50 years of age. Now, that may also be the contributing factor to lesser uh, severity, lesser oxygen requirement, and lesser deaths because these are youngsters. That means in a country where the age range is not, not such, they may not benefit from this or they may have to be more careful. 
although I'm going to show you the age range and the comorbidities that are at risk. So they could actually become more selectively careful. So here, 71% are lesser than 50 years of age, and the average age is 38.5%, uh, five years, same percent. So that is interesting. That means every community, if you use this data, this is preliminary, this is better than first December data, this is one more week added to it, and given the faster pace of this virus, this one week added is actually sufficient to give us a good highlight of what is coming. But if you take this data and apply it to another community, that community's age comorbidities will have to be considered. Now, patient count. First three waves, 126,000 patients. Omicron wave, I did not get the total number. Incidental finding. He's saying that now 90% of the cases that they are finding in the hospitals. So he has a, or, or Netcare has a chain of hospitals. 90% of the cases are incidental. That is, Netcare has a policy of testing everyone. And 90% of positive cases are found because they tested them, not because they came in and said, we have a problem. They came in for something else, for another disease, for another checkup, for a lab thing or something related to that for uh, obstetric, uh, obstetrics, for pregnancies, incidental, 90% incidental. Admissions, previous waves, 55,000 were admitted out of everyone who was seen in the hospitals and clinics, 44% were admitted. Here, out of all, so I still do not have the whole number yet, but only 337 admitted. I can say this, that from a, from a case rise point of view, there is a, this is absolute number of cases. So they're almost behaving like a wave. Even then 337 in net care hospitals and 55,000 previously in net care hospitals. ICU admission out of those that came into the hospital, ICU admission previously used to be 26% going to the ICU. You would see that over here, very few went to ICU. Again, I didn't have the exact number. Oxygen, oxygen, all admitted needed oxygen in the previous waves, 100% needed oxygen. This wave, 33 patients need oxygen out of 337, that is 10%. Ventilation, eight patients are on ventilation, 2%. Out of these eight, two of them were trauma cases who also were COVID positive. So really six because of COVID on the ventilation, two on the ventilation because of trauma, but all are also COVID positive. And look at the data down here. 1100 patients positive out of 32,000 outpatient. So in the net care facilities, 32,000 patients were seen. Out of them, 1100 only were COVID positive. And then 22,000 patients were re received. This is from November 15 onwards. 22,000 patients were received in emergency rooms. Out of them, 816 were COVID positive. Do you see how the numbers are actually really low? It would be great to actually compare that to the previous waves and the total counts. But anyway, still, you can see this number here, admissions 55,000 versus 337. Again, it is a preliminary, but if you see here, a wave size here is May 11 to October 7. So May, June, July, August, September, October. So there is six months in there. So here we're only looking at two or three weeks data. It needs to be extrapolated, but um, or it needs to be observed more. But still in the same duration, because the number of cases are similar, 
the hospitalizations and oxygen and ICU requirements are not. So during the first three waves, when the overall community positivity rate breached 26%, so out of a community, 26% became positive. We were inundated with COVID-19 admissions to hospital. Within net care, we had over 2,000 COVID-19 patients in hospital during the first wave, over 2,250 during the second and 3,000 during the third. At present, the 337 patients represent a fraction compared to previous waves. Again, the data size is becoming equal to previous waves. Duration is not. It went up faster. But still, the numbers are small. The very rapid rise in community transmission as compared to previous waves may partially explain this relatively low hospital admission rate. However, there does appear to be a decoupling in terms of the rate of hospital admissions at this early stage in the ev evolution of the fourth wave. Once again, keep putting the age and the uh, that community status in front of you, meaning we cannot just take this number and apply it everywhere. I can say this, that it would seem like everywhere in the world, the behavior should be better of this virus. 800 admissions since November 15th, 75% unvaccinated. He said Netcare has seen seven deaths over this period in this group. So 75% were unvaccinated. So that is about 600. So 600 admitted unvaccinated. Out of them, seven deaths. So actually not 75%, but out of 800, seven deaths. So about 1% of which four may be ascribed to COVID-19. So not even 1%, half percent. The ages of these four patients ranged from 58 to 91. This is what I would like you to consider. 58 to 91 years of age, and all had significant comorbidities. So how do we see it in the previous data? Previously, what we knew was, out of 100 patients who are hospitalized, about 20 would end up in ICU. Out of those who end up in the ICU, out of this whole 100 that ended up in the hospital actually, 4 to 5%, 6% would die. In some hospital, 3%, in some hospital, 6%. So 100 patients who go to a hospital, 3 to 6 would die of COVID. Here, a hundred patient who go to hospital, half dies. So that means out of 201 dies. That's a great efficacy compared to where we were. Efficacy of the uh, Omicron or incidence rate is really low or hazard ratio compared to the previous is really good. This is really important. Previously, out of 100 in the hospital, 3 to 6 would die. In here, out of 200, 1 will die. And even then, the age range 58 to 91 and significant comorbidities. So this is my quick depiction. Here is a little O and here is a big P. Why are you doing this to me, bro? I actually thought that there should be... <laughs> The cartoon, I thought I just did not know how to draw it very well. That was that Big P is on the floor and Little O is tasing it. And it is saying, don't tase me, bro. Okay, so with this, let's just very quickly see if there is any uh, questions. Otherwise, I'm going to hang up now. I will come back again in about half an hour and discuss some more topics as well. Um, please like, subscribe, and share. I'm going to keep it short. That is why I'll come back with some more data afterwards. And if you would like to support this work, not just for the Omicron and COVID, if you would like to support this work for healthcare and medical students in general as your contribution to this, um, I think that healthcare nursing students, medical students need to understand medicine more clearly. That is my mission. That's what I'm doing. 
then you can support this work. There is a Patreon link, there is a PayPal link, and there is a link for buy me a coffee. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in about an hour again. And sorry to puncture your weekend with this extra talk. I think that pandemic is winding up. Bye-bye.